Global Brain Singularity, which I submitted for the degree of Doctor of Interdisciplinary Studies. And as chair appointed by the Pato faculty, I declare hate by the defense open. I will briefly explain what we're going to do now. So first of all, PhD candidate will summarize the dissertation during a 20 minute presentation. Next on, each member of the jury will be able to uh, comment and including the supervisor. And after that, the audience will have some time to ask questions if they choose to do so. This whole procedure will, will not be allowed to take any longer than two hours, so the schedule is really, really tight, and I will say for every jury member how much time they get to ask questions and to fill out time to answer. And finally, we will read out to a separate room to uh, decide the outcome of the public defense. So to start with, I will give Kadal the floor to present this work in a 20 minute presentation. Well, welcome for those who, who, who came and thanks for the, the jury for um, for all the organization and all of the, the time and energy you put into uh, put into reading the thesis and, um, uh, and and commenting and giving feedback. The Global Brain Singularity as a Thesis, uh, Universal History, Future Evolution and Humanities Dialectical Horizon is a, a work of um, research that, interdisciplinary research that took about five, five years of, of formal training and, and a much longer uh, period of time of, of deep personal questioning, um, fundamentally about what it means to be a human in the 21st century. Um, The thesis um, as a whole is structured between four parts, which roughly correspond to different temporal uh, epochs, past, present, future, and then uh, meta-reflective return to the present. Um, each of the parts is structured by uh, a central concept, which tries to organize the main themes. Um, and we'll go through this presentation uh, part by part starting with past, moving to present, going to future, and then meta-reflectively returning to the present. So part one, titled Contextualizing the Present, is organized by the concept of universal evolution. And this concept of universal evolution was primarily relied upon to structure uh, different analytical tools from the humanities perspective, big history, and from the scientific perspective, cosmic evolution. And these tools are uh, general analytical uh, frameworks that are useful to be, that are useful for studying um, phenomena as a whole and process as a whole. In cosmic evolution, uh, phenomena or evolution are um, 
categorized in between physical, biological, and cultural evolution. And the main utility of using these tools is that it gives us a type of perspective on the present, which we don't normally um, utilize or, or, or reflect upon. When we think about the present, we're often thinking about the problems and the tensions of the present from the perspective of last year or last decade or maybe last century. Maybe in the formal study of history, human history as a whole. But with cosmic evolution or big history, you're situating the present within the context of universal process as a whole or universal evolution as a whole. And that specifically to my analysis brings up two interesting points of attention. Uh, the first point of attention is the strangeness of cultural and technological evolution. Um, its situation within the big picture framework and its possible consequences in the future of evolution. And also brings attention to a particular uh, epistemological tension that has gone on now and has been called, called the two cultures divide for a few decades. On the one hand, physical reductionism and on the other hand, which tends to structure many of the sciences, and uh, discursive historicism, which tends to structure much of the humanities. The reason why a universal evolutionary framework approaches these two cultures divide in an interesting way is that it allows us to focus on the, emer the reality of the emergence of evolutionary processes on the one hand, which physical reductionism uh, tends to either neglect or be unable to approach, and on the other hand, uh, universal dimension, which tends to be um, uh, treated by discursive historicism in a type of particularized or relativized way. Um, when you apply the framework of universal evolution, there are two major trends that immediately come to attention. One may be called a global cosmological view, which has tended to dominate um, uh, many global scientific frameworks throughout the 20th century. It tends to be situated in a thermodynamic framework of energy dissipation, which gives the predictive uh, view that the universe is tending towards universal disorder and simplicity. Basically, a picture of the universe where, in the end, nothing is related to anything else. However, with the universal evolutionary framework, an opposing view immediately comes to attention, which you might frame as a more local Earth perspective. And in this framework, um, the role of information, uh, the role of, instead of a thermodynamic, maybe more of a teleodynamic framework comes to mind of the increasing complexity and order, and consequently the uh, types of emergence that can be produced by new forms of relation. So instead of the universe tending towards less relationality, that you have a view of the universe that's tending towards uh, increasingly uh, strange and diverse relations. When you situate all of this, uh, uh, these notions in the cosmic evolutionary view in relationship to our modern historical context, there may be a different way of viewing the present moment, specifically uh, the modernist symbolic scaffolding. Um, modernism is a symbolic, uh, maybe a meta paradigm is the right word to use, which tends to rely on science, reason, and empiricism uh, to approach building a higher level of being in a secular context. The interesting uh, divide that emerges between modernism and pre-modernism is that in the pre-modern context, the notion of a higher order of being is present, but it is often situated in a supernatural or otherworldly context. Whereas in the modern context, this notion of a higher order of being is something situated in relationship to uh, symbolic practices which can be developed in a secular context. And in that sense, modernism may have noted uh, almost unconsciously that there is uh, a way in which human beings are participating in this trend towards higher complexity and order. In the last few decades, modernism as a framework has come under uh, intense criticism from a meta paradigm we might call postmodernism, which is a type of meta skepticism and meta criticism. This meta skepticism and meta criticism tends to focus on the particular contingent emergence of modernism, um, its, its, its origin in Europe, its instantiation in a certain patriarchal relations, uh, its 
it's, it's, uh, it's, it's contingent happening, all sorts of ways in which modernism could be uh, particularized and relativized. However, in the cosmic evolutionary framework or in the universal evolutionary framework, we might uh, call some attention to the um, universal efficacy of things like science and reason and empiricism and their universal effects in terms of their technological reach and their, um, uh, and their universality in a different dimension, not their, not their particular contingent emergence within a certain historical context, but their um, possibility to universally transform what it means to be human. And in that sense, I call attention to the possibility of rethinking the relation between modernism and postmodernism in phenomena like transhumanism or posthumanism and other such discourses which are um, 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 currently emerging in the 21st century. In the second part of the thesis, I then focus to the present moment and challenges of a global metasystem under the concept of the global brain. In order to structure this analysis, I focus on the concept of the metasystem, which is a general cosmic evolutionary concept which can be generalized to the universe as a whole. It's useful in explaining the emergence of complexity in the physical and biological world. In my thesis, I specifically focus on uh, the human system and metasystems that have emerged um, with hunter-gatherer organizations, agricultural organizations, industrial organizations, and the present moment, and try to uh, structure an analysis of the relationship between information, energy, and control and what this analysis um, reveals or suggests is that there is a type of pattern of relation between information, energy, and control that's useful in thinking about things that are happening in the present moment in relationship to a global metasystem. So very quickly to go over this, uh, this, this pattern, uh, with hunter-gatherer organizations, language emerged which allowed for new energy control with hunting regimes, which allowed for new forms of control organizations with bands and tribes. Um, in the agricultural uh, regime, which was stabilized by the emergence of writing and allowed for new forms of control organization with chieftains and kingdoms. And in the industrial era, you would have the emergence of things like the printing press, which allowed for new forms of energy extraction in the industrial era with fossil fuels and so forth and scientific regimes of knowledge which allowed for new control organizations like nation states and international organizations. Now, it's clear that with the emergence of the internet, we have a new information medium, which is global in scope, but which has yet to um, develop uh, new forms of uh, uh, energy and control mechanisms, which would sort of solidify a new type of control organization. And that brings me to the idea that one of the fundamental problems of our present moment is uh, that on an objective level, I think we can identify, and many different movements have identified, that there are problems of uh, a global nature which do not uh, have, uh, that we do not have adequate control mechanisms to deal with. Um, of course, we could spend a lot of time going into each dimension of these global problems. Um, there are problems of, on the ecological level, there are problems on the economical level, there are problems on the social level, there are even problems on a biological foundations level, there are problems on a tech certainly technological emergence level. All of these different dimensions um, have an inherent global or planetary nature to them, and uh, the big question or, or, or meditation, I think, for our species in the next few decades is what controls on a global level uh, can we can we produce that allow us to think about these problems and potentially approach and solve these problems in a new way? In my thesis, I propose the concept of the commons, which is not a new concept of, of my of my my own mind, but a, a, a concept that has a historical origin that I try to engage with and suggest that in terms of political economic discourse, the commons may be a useful concept to approach some of these. Um, issues which have an inherent global uh, uh, nature or inherent global scope. Um, I would situate this in terms of the problems of the meta -pol political economic frameworks of, say, uh, market oriented and state oriented solutions, which might be framed in, in various ways, neoliberal, maybe framed Keynesian, uh, but that these approaches, whatever their successes in the 20th century, and there are many successes for these approaches in the 20th century. Um, they don't seem to be able to hold the complexity and the globality of the problem
problems which are emerging in the 21st century. And so uh, even though this is extremely difficult to think, I would just quickly uh, bring up and bring attention to two major categories uh, of, of uh, possibility that the commons could be useful in thinking. Uh, both are related to global brain-like future technologies. Uh, on the one hand, uh, if we are entering a world of potential mass automation, if we are entering a world of uh, radically different functionality of the way in which human civilization operates, then the notion of the commons may be a useful notion to open up discussions about what a political economy of abundance, open access, and new forms of workers' democracies might look like. On the other hand, um, uh, and, and potentially even more difficult to think, the emergence of new technology in regards to uh, uh, social networks, uh, digital sh uh, social networks, sharing networks, and other forms of um, 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 innovations, uh, open up a huge uh, opportunity and a huge potential to rethink value how we build value, how we form communities, and how we how we basically measure, and how we how we uh, develop new systems of valuation. Uh, and this this uh, might not include uh, direct relation to money as a as as, a, as money has a, uh, a potentially a unidimensional uh, nature, and it, although it has a universal nature. But we need to think also. Uh, with the emergence of the sharing economy, forms of valuations that have uh, more subtle and more nuanced ways of, 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 um, of valuing the, 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 social, the social dimension of our economy. And so the commons I would situate as important in those regards. In part three, I approach signs of a new evolution under the concept of the techno-cultural. And this section is really uh, pushing even deeper into speculative territory although I try to do it within uh, certain evolutionary constraints and thinking. Of course, evolutionary theory has been uh, dominant and, and incredibly successful in the sciences in the last two centuries and has gone a long way into helping us understand the biological world um, and biological diversity and complexity. Um, and of course, evolutionary thinking has also gone a long way into helping us make sense of ourselves and making sense of human beings. Um, the problem with evolutionary, not the problem with evolutionary theory, but one of the dimensions of evolutionary theory, which is difficult to think, is the strange way in which humans are not just biological but cultural, and the interaction between biological and cultural <coughs> dimensions of evolution. Now, in my thesis, I apply the idea of life history theory, which is basically a theory of time and energy, that we have limited time and energy, and that this time and energy can be uh, dedicated to uh, processes of growth, maintenance and reproduction. Uh, when you apply this theory to the history of the primate order, what you see is that increasingly from the simplest primates to the more complex primates, time and energy is increasingly uh, invested into growth and maintenance at the expense of quantity of reproduction. This process uh, is in relationship to the growth of our neocortex size and the expansion of our life history, living longer essentially, and that um, this gets magnified with the emergence of humans, but then gets further magnified through different metasystems to the agricultural world, to the industrial world, and to the present, which in very short and, and, and reduced terms leads to a potential way to make sense of, or one other way of making sense of the modern demographic transition where you have a radical reduction in our uh, biological uh, uh, reproduction to below replacement levels. And in the, uh, in the big picture or in the big historical framework, um, what I'm interested in is the long-term relationship between these two processes. So biocultural evolution, in some sense, is tending towards a, a, a time and energy investment where more and more uh, uh, cultural and technological adaptations are leading towards um, uh, essentially, uh, just losing my train of thought here just a, a sec. Um, basically, the, the, the possibility for a type of uh, 
decoupling of, of the relationship between biology and culture. And in thinking about this possible decoupling between biology and culture, I rely on a metaphor uh, in a cosmic evolutionary context of abiogenesis. Um, where a new evolutionary process has emerged previously in the history of our universe. So of course there was a time in our universe where there wasn't biological evolution, and chemists refer to the process of the emergence of biological evolution as abiogenesis. I use that concept as a metaphor to potentially situate a new way of thinking about the relationship between culture and biology, that culture and technology are in some sense infantile or immature evolutionary processes, which have yet to gain autonomy and independence from their biological origin, and that uh, in the future, um, uh, evolutionary processes could be driven by um, um, more advanced or more mature forms of cultural and technological evolution. This leads into the, mo the most probably speculative dimensions of my thesis, um, which is the nature of future evolutionary forms. Um, the nature of future evolutionary form, if you take the logic of some of this evolutionary scaffolding to its sort of logical conclusion, could be a type of techno-cultural evolution, which um, gives, which is driven essentially by conscious uh, selection mechanisms. If you think about biological evolution, one of the defining features of, of biological evolution is the concept of natural selection. The fact that form and function are defined by, in, in some sense, blind um, and uh, uh, unconscious processes. But it could be that evolution is undergoing an evolution of itself and could be in the future driven by conscious selection mechanisms um, through, symbolic, uh, through symbolic mechanisms and through new technological mediums. With technology defined in a very broad sense, it could be anything from uh, genetic engineering to nanotechnology, to robotics. Uh, if you genetically engineer uh, the entire genome of the human species, this would be a type of conscious selection, a type of technological uh, a, a modification of natural selection. In the most speculative domains of my thesis, I then propose um, a framework for thinking about the possible deep futures of consciousness and intelligence. On the one hand, framed under the expansion hypothesis, and on the other hand, framed under the compression hypothesis. With the expansion hypothesis, you have a very intuitive view of the future of intelligence and consciousness, which everyone has come to internalize through 20th century science fiction. Things like Star Trek and Star Wars, where intelligence and consciousness are basically uh, interstellar, intergalactic even. And you have this idea of intelligence and consciousness expanding throughout the universe. Of course, this view has the uh, problem of Fermi's paradox of if that is the direction of future intelligence and future consciousness, then where are the others? Why don't we see an intelligent and conscious universe? That's one big problem. Um, the alternative framework I try to explore in the thesis is the compression hypothesis, the idea that intelligence and consciousness does not expand out into the physical universe, but compresses to the lower levels of, the, uh, of reality, to the uh, cellular, um, uh, atomic and, 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 and lower levels of reality through different technological manipulations, whether that's nanotechnology down to Planck level technology, and that this could be a way of thinking about uh, not only that we have the technological capability potentially to do that in the future, but also that reality seems to be fundamentally open to such manipulations. Part four goes into uh, a meta-reflective return to the present after going into deep speculative realms of the future and focuses on uh, our knowledge practices and the potential utility of uh, a dialectic. So the framework I use uh, for metaphysics is a concept of non-monism, which I situate in relationship to the traditional category of monism, which is basically the metaphysical scaffolding of our traditional monotheistic religions, and the metaphysical category of multiplicity, which tends to structure most postmodern epistemologies. Uh, the concept of non-monism attempts to approach two important dimensions to my mind. The first dimension is the internal desire for integration, um, and the second dimension is the irreducible um, type of uh, binary of subject and object in, re in relation to the appearances of reality. And uh, 
with that metaphysical framework, I try to basically uh, make sense of the importance of playing in the appearances or, or, or uh, playing in the antagonistic uh, structure of our knowledge practices, essentially. On the level of the concept, I try to use this concept of non-monism to articulate basically uh, the strange nature of unity uh, first, um, and perhaps given the short duration of the presentation, the most useful way of applying this concept would be to myself and the nature of this very thesis, where the concept is presented to you as unified, the global brain singularity thesis, but that it is internally divided within itself between past and future. And I'm saying that this general structure of unity is um, not just the foundation of the metaphysics I'm proposing, but also an important way to understand uh, the field of knowledge as such. So, let's wrap up in two minutes. Um, just to, 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 to wrap up with the two last points, which I think are important, um, the pragmatic application of this metaphysics, I think, can be demonstrated quite powerfully. Um, and, 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 I'll, and, and if, you, if, you, if you forgive a certain repetition, I will go through some of the fields in which I think this idea is useful. If you take, for example, the field of physics, this is a unified field, but is divided between general relativity and quantum mechanics. If you take the field of ontology, this is a unified field, but divided between evolution and eternity, as evidenced by the science-religion divide. Um, if you take the field of academia, it is a unified field, but divided between the sciences and the humanities. If you take the field of philosophy, it is a unified field, but divided between analytics and continental. If you take the political field, it is unified, but divided in the polar extremes between fascism and communism. If you take the idea of developmental, uh, uh, the developmental social field, you have a unified field which is divided between individuation and collectivization. If you take the sexual field, it is unified but internally divided between the masculine and the feminine. If you take the metaphysical field, it is unified but divided between matter and mind. If you take the field of existence itself, it is unified but divided between life and death. And finally, if you take the field of being, it is unified but divided between something and nothing. And in that sense, when I come to the point of thinking in this way, um, the main message I want to convey is that it is a metaphysics that might help us to approach global brain singularity from an observer-dependent framework, where you are thinking about these uh, contradictory identities which are constantly caught between themselves and their own opposite. And my main message here, because again, time of, is uh, battling, is um, uh, uh, the subjective mode of desire. When you're in a subjective mode of desire, you will always find yourself striving for an impossible unity and ultimately battling with your opposite. You will be in life battling with death. You will be man or woman battling with your opposite. You will be a scientist or a humanitarian battling with your opposite. Uh, something battling with nothing, individual battling with the collective and so forth. Could go on. But that the mode of the drive is a way to internalize the unity of the concept in the present moment and to in some sense become with the, the, the inherent division which is at the core of unity. Uh, and that is the idea of global brain singularity and um, forgive me for going five minutes over. <laughs>
the author lucidly reviews a number of uh, different elaborated scenarios, pointing out that sexual weaknesses, visitation, void, and homotopy structures. And it's quite impressive that it has been published, uh, that practically all the papers have been published in peer reviewed journals of international astronomy in the work of science. So, congratulations, this really is an impressive, extraordinary piece of work. Now, about my questions, uh, I have two questions. Uh, one to do with, of course, my own interest in when you speak about the commons, you speak about the automatic commons, and you make a number of uh, references to the offer network. This is a concept that I have also been developing together with Ben Gerso, and I wanted to hear maybe more if you have better an idea in how far the offer networks could really from personal terms and for capitalism and communism from this commons point of view. Yeah, I think as I yeah, as I, I tried to say in the in the presentation, I really think if 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 I if I go over all of the different dimensions of, of my thesis where I sort of reach internal limits in my ability to think, I would say maybe the most difficult thing to think is the offer network and future economics. Precise, precisely because, pre precisely because, I'm, I'm, a little um, scared of the level of utopian visions of transcending capitalism in the past and how they have failed, um, and how difficult and how how many strange paradoxes emerge when you interact and you um, try to give yourself to a sharing economy type style. There's all sorts of problems which I feel like we are, we are going to um, uh, fail to anticipate and which are going to take us by surprise. Um, at the end of the day, I, I, I think that situating, situating what I've been thinking lately is trying to situate the idea of the offer network as like a, as, as I think you often say, as like a, a, a mystery and an adventure for consciousness, ultimately, that, that, that we are going to learn a lot about ourselves by simply experimenting and giving ourselves to these types of offer networks and that we have, to, and that we can only be open, fundamentally open to um, surprises about our own identity and, and our own desires. As, as we go as we go through I think that um, at the core what is most challenging to think is how do you measure social value um, how do you measure social value that is inherently not not quantifiable or, or, or is in some sense you know difficult if that makes sense to to track I mean I mean in some in some sense, in some sense, capitalism is, I could just give a practical example, capitalism is such um, a brutal reduction because, like for example, I got a, a PhD scholarship to do this four year here, but it, and, and in some sense it just sort of covers my existence, but in terms of the, the value I produce, it, it, it can't be, you can't put a number on it. And I think that would go for you know any, any other PhD student or postdoc or something like that. It, it's difficult to say what, what, you know, how you would develop a system for, accurately capturing this value, if, if that makes sense. So, so it's, it's, it's the most difficult thing to think. Um, within, a commons, within a commons framework, it's, it's traditionally defined by Eleanor Ostrom as a, as a um, coming up with, with common property regimes, where instead of, instead of, instead of understanding um, from the perspective of a type of, basically you try to identify a problem that is universally shared and a way to distribute resources for that particular problem. So I think it's, it's, it's a useful way to think about global warming or it's a useful way to think about inequality or it's a useful way to think about um, uh, possible problems with transhumanism. I'm not sure yet what the solution is for for situating it with offer networks, but it's 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 the most difficult thing to think. So maybe one comment is that the idea of offer network is precisely what you do away with the idea of an absolute value. You don't put a number on something. What you do is you make an offer of a number of choices, an offer of a number of demands, and you put 
apply too much to one thing, but it, which means that you don't need to agree about what the value of a particular offer is. But if it's the best one, it's still a particular demand, it will fill it. So it's more like in, in physics, you have the idea of a gradient. A gradient is a direction of steeper system. That means that's where the system will go. The absolute level doesn't count. You have the potential energy, which is a number. And you have the gradient, which is the force. But what you really are interested in is the force. It tells you, go in that direction. It doesn't tell you, you are that high, or you are that high, or you have that much energy. That's a convention. The number is a convention. What is important is that you have the choices and that you have a preference. It's preference. It's choosing the best for the possible option. <coughs> Uh, but let me maybe go back to my other question. First, I wanted also to make uh, another remark about uh, something I particularly like. It's your chapter about uh, biological reproduction and aging, where you try lipids and theory. I think you made there a very critical uh, review of indeed how from uh, this, the, the lower mammals up to the the apes and the first humans, and now there is this very strong shift from reproduction to investment in longer term growth and uh, longer life, which in the limit would lead to immortality without continuing reproduction. So uh, yeah. I, I very much uh, like that chapter. But uh, my last question is, uh, well, you know that I have some difficulty with your uh, dialectical chapter, and I still don't quite get this idea of the non-monism. Yeah. It's obvious that our mind makes distinctions, it makes oppositions. Mm. These oppositions are to some degree artificial, they are constructed, they are waiting to make create some order in a chaos. But the top of the bag developed in my PhD to the cell I was most proud of was the topic of distinction dynamics. And distinction dynamics says distinctions are not absolute. They are not there, they are not unchanging. They evolve as well, and they can get resolved. So my view of dialectic is thesis calls up antithesis, and antithesis and thesis together produce a synthesis, which then again calls up an antithesis, and so on. The, the distinctions themselves are just the steps in a process that goes on. Mm -hmm. So opposing them as absolutes, to me, this is kind of against the philosophy of processes. So things are there temporarily, but when there are processes that change them into different ones and different ones. To me, it's that the process is constantly structured between these antagonisms. So like, for example, you have a thesis, an antithesis, and a synthesis, but the synthesis is never complete. It always is going to break into another binary opposition. And so the idea is, is that, yeah, this there is there is these these open-ended processes, but these open-ended processes always get caught between between the two. And yeah, but they don't need to be the same two. Like for example, I'll give you an example of quantum mechanics and relativity theory. I'm pretty sure that sooner or later some gun 25 hero will come that unifies them. But then people will after a while start discovering that this gun 25 theory has a number of shortcomings and they will propose an opposite yeah. theory, and then you will again have the same opposition, but it will be the two completely different things. Exactly. But th that's that and that, 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 that. Well, when like you formulate it, it's not that these are eternal absolutes. No, no, it's the particular, no, it's the, the meta-reflective, the meta-reflection on the present is trying to articulate the, the binary opposition of the present field, but the, the field itself will constantly be changing in the process. So, so whatever the binary opposition is between the future field of physics will be totally different. But it's useful to know what the binary oppositions of the present field are as they're working themselves out, especially the binary oppositions between things like life and death or something and nothing. These types of binary oppositions seem absolutely fundamental in some level, and what the synthesis of those fields would be is something post-human. Uh, I mean, if you, I mean if, you if you synthesize life and death, if you synthesize something and nothing, I mean, what the hell is that? Uh, well, I can actually uh, imagine solutions to that. I mean, I was in, in Tokyo at a workshop on uh, the origin of life, and then the general tenure was that there isn't an origin of life. It's an evolutionary process where you start off with things that are 
clearly looks quite alive, and I just thought it was a clearly all alive. But then you bring that in and are neither alive nor not alive. We can't really say whether that is alive or not. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is, I think that, that it's this kind of transition, this um, uh, tension of, of, of opposites, which is the process of science, that mm -hmm. things that seem so obvious, it can be either only alive or not. Mm -hmm. No, you can be something in between. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the next speaker. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I guess. <laughs> Uh, so the next question is very general and it's about your, your examination. This this policy is the founder and director of Yale Science Communication Impact Network and a faculty member at Yale University. Professor Lucy, you will have 15 minutes to yes. do it. Hmm? No, Paul is here. Paul is not here. This is Andre. This is Andre Kalpa, yes. Paul is here. No, okay. I missed that in emails. <laughs> so I switch to the next one. Professor Kolokai, yeah. National Research University High School of Economics. Can you please elaborate on monitoring the stabilizer risks? And we'll have 15 minutes to, to do it. Candidates? Yes. Please. You can go slightly over 15 then because I miscalculated. Oh, okay. No. The start is the best. With my general evaluation of cadre of people, it is very difficult to talk for cadre of universe. And it's the best in the right attempt to understand the, the global brain singularity and through, through a logical meditation on temporal dynamics of the big picture process. And I have no doubt about the, the importance of, of the set of issues studied in the present thesis. Uh, this uh, thesis is getting a uh, valuable and original contribution to interdisciplinary studies. The white cover is uh, the material collected by the authors themselves, uh, the tutors and uh, themselves and the, the work. This material puts uh, this dissertation on the high scientific level. The thesis uh, certainly deserves its uh, publication as a monograph after a rather limited amount of additional work. No? Uh, there, are, there are some problems uh, with uh, the version of uh, the thesis which was uh, discussed uh, at uh, uh, the private defense. Uh, no, I think everybody has complained, complained that it was not still sufficiently structured there was uh, no uh, clear explanation of uh, the functions of the different parts of the thesis, and uh, there were no uh, clear uh, conclusions corresponding to the main goals of uh, the thesis and uh, um, the, uh, all the main parts of the thesis. No, however, it was noted already uh, in uh, during the private defense that uh, uh, the speech presented by a cadre of the, the defense uh, contained the whole the rest of uh, the elements which were missing in the, in the text, just the explanation of uh, the function of the parts and uh, uh, much better structure to complain. And uh, so uh, it was recommended uh, to cover to uh, Restructure the thesis, and it looked uh, uh, well, otherwise, if, if uh, there was no clear the explanation of the structure of the thesis uh, in uh, the speech of Cadol uh, himself, uh, no, this uh, task m might uh, look not minor, but uh, it was uh, still not suggested as uh, just uh, minor. Clear that it is in the final version of uh, the thesis which uh, we have right now. Uh, this uh, problem was uh, mended, so now there is uh, quite a good uh, explanation of uh, uh, the function of uh, the main part of the thesis and uh, uh, in the introduction and much better structured uh, conclusions uh, at the end. So now I believe. Uh, Oh, 
you're, but depending on the observer, depending on the distinctions the observer wants to bring up in this history, an alternative historical view of the control system emergences could be constructed. I don't certainly don't think my narrative is the is the absolute or the only possible narrative construction of that. Uh, and, and 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 depending on, I suppose it would depend on 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 the the. the the use value of the construction. For me, I was mostly trying to emphasize how the emergence of fundamentally new information mediums um, could lead to transformations of control and, and, and specifically trying to orient that idea in relationship to what's happening with the global brain. So in doing that, I feel like there are many subtleties both with the industrial transition, with the agricultural transition, and the hunter-gatherer transition that would require more sufficient attention at the, at, in, in the micro level, micro level analysis. Um, and I certainly don't think that my, my analysis would, would, would preclude, preclude or, or prohibit such a, such a more, more, more detailed investigation. Um, perhaps, perhaps, another perhaps another example of that that I, I gloss over is like, I don't pay too much attention, for example, to um, uh, the emergence of telecommunications in the late 19th or earliest 20th century, and I pay more attention to the emergence of the internet, which is something that if you pay a lot of attention to that, and a lot of social theorists have, you might, you might um, notice different patterns, for example. But, but I, 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 think your, I think your point is, uh, is, is, a, is accurate and valid. Uh, it's just not uh, something that, that I, I focused on in, in, in in that dimension, I suppose. No, so, so, so I think you have a good discussion. It's, it's a good discussion. Uh, no, the, the absence uh, of um, new influences yeah. might be still uh, possible and uh, pardonable for uh, thesis, but perhaps uh, when it comes to being thesis, it's a moment that still no, it would need some more nuancing of the uh, uh, patterns of the uh, uh, system transition. Yeah. No, the, I also wonder again uh, why the tool, especially in this epoch, is a sort of uh, global brain singularity in uh, the universal history discusses. No, uh, I wonder it would, it would not make uh, sense for such. Uh, monument still to make a sort of, to try to make a sort of uh, a unified scheme of uh, uh, meta system transition uh, including uh, meta system transition tra transition in particular pre human uh, um, part of uh, universal history uh, and uh, no, perhaps uh, there are some hints to this uh, theory of meta system transition in other parts of uh, uh, the thesis, but still to have uh, a sort of unified scheme of meta system. But because uh, the transition to nuclear itself is evidently a meta system transition in the, uh, the pre human world. So it's, it's, I think every the explosion is, uh, might be discussed as a possible meta system transition. No, again, as I said, perhaps uh, for as uh, the thesis was composed of different articles and uh, such, uh, but uh, don't you, you, you agree that uh, when developing uh, um, the um, no, monograph on the basis of the thesis, it would make sense to uh, try to, to, to just uh, uh, to study a sort of uh, uh, general scheme of meta system transition, starting from the origins of life and uh, up to, I don't know, what global brain singularity. Especially if it is universal history, the second. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think, and I, and I think that there are many people um, who have, um, and, and I think you and your research group um, have done that. Like the, the, the thing, I guess, the, the main thing that, that's jumping to my mind right now is um, a, a figure 
Um, I forget if it was originally a figure done by Carl Sagan and just. Or, uh, yeah. But yeah, I think I think the figure is originally by Carl Sagan. I know it was used kind of by by Ray Kurzweil as well of 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 trying to take all of the different narratives of meta systems or take all of the different narratives of major transitions and trying to see if there's common overlap between all of the ways in which different people have classified different meta systems and seeing if there's like sort of one common thread of, of events that people identify as 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 in some sense objective. Um, I, I mean I'm I'm certainly um, not opposed to such such activities or such, um, I think they're valid research um, directions. And um, again, I would I would just situate what I did as 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 yet another uh, attempt to do something along those lines of of, of constructing a, a history of, of major transitions. Um, and yeah, in in my in my narrative articulation, um, I could certainly. You know, have 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 constructed it otherwise, or paid attention to certain distinctions that I I, I didn't highlight. Um, and and if I were to, for example, take one of my meta system papers, specifically the one that's coming to mind is the paper that I published in the journal of Evolution and Technology, and and were were to spend say, you know, twenty five pages unpacking each. Meta system, I would be able to highlight distinctions that I gloss over in the bigger scene, and that and that might, and that might change the way I'm thinking about the relationship between information, energy, and control, or or it might not. I I, I would have to. Yeah, that would be a, a big project. Well, you could say to to give this to give the name of the systems is maybe just add the the, the, the yes the the, the right the number of uh, list of the meta system meta system. Right now, yeah. but I think it's still, um, no, it's especially, it's a little bit of a search, it's a little bit of a name. But uh, my title, my thing, uh, again, it makes sense to try to make, to make some progress in this direction too, but the point that as Carlo knows very well, no, by now there is no consensus at mm -hmm. all uh, about the power of the chain of the metasystem transition. It's like, because uh, no, there are huge differences I'd say that, I mean, overall, I really enjoy it. I think that we agree in 99% of what you write, in, but Here we the, the interesting <laughs> thing is to focus in the 1%. That's what I agree. Because yeah. that is. I'm, a, I'm against the 1%. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's precisely those, those moments of discord that allow us to grow together, yeah. I would say. If we just agree with each other, we don't move any far. I mean, I, I just planned three kind of steps, I'll try to be very short. I will just point out very quickly that what were for me the highlights of your thesis. 
make a short commentary on the way I read the thesis as a whole, in a way, and not going too much into the detail, because I think it's very, very interesting to sit down at some point in the future and spend a long day going actually article by article, but I don't think there is the space to do that. And then I have one question. Uh, the highlights, I mean, uh, the importance of philosophy to understand science. Scientists today are achieving fantastic results in quantum physics, genetics, robotics, computing, etc. But poor guys, they don't have the tools to understand what they are doing. I mean. They need, in a way, they themselves start to engage in philosophy or actually start to work. And, and philosophers themselves have to pay attention to this kind of results that are emerging. So this bringing together these two different cultures that you mentioned, for me, is a very highlight of, of your thesis. Mm -hmm. uh, against fragmentation of the postmodern fragmentation, I think it's, it was very important, postmodernism was to do is, has a very important role, is mystifying the big narratives, etc. But it's not enough. We have to go a little bit far. We have to think again in terms of totality. Mm -hmm. This likes to address another highlight that I, I would really enjoy in your thesis, the, the notion that we come with a common scale. The fact that we need to, uh, to realize that today we are addressing global problems and local solutions are not enough. We have to think in a way global. And there is a gap in the global brain in a way that that notion is in a way uh, helpful to understand the global. So I really enjoy that, uh, reading that. And of course, uh, although you try to come up with the solution, this is a very complicated thing. And of course, it's very easy to be in your desk and to write how the world should be. But then if you take the Hegelian dialectical notion, those ideas don't matter at all. You have to actualize them in the concrete circumstances of today. And the, today the world is a very complicated place to be. I mean, things don't necessarily go, and I, I'm not as optimist as you are in the way saying that this common that you could be, I think uh, things are a bit more complex. Yeah. Yeah. But we are going there. But uh, again, just to raise the, the question. I will kill my old self next year. But that's my <laughs> final question for you, because you opened the space for a personal question, so my question is actually personal. But, uh, <laughs> so, need to address, like you mentioned very nicely, how do we view new large-scale political collapses when you realize that the state is no longer working? So, sh shall we give up the global struggle, or should we, in a way, attempt to conceive global organisms that in a way replace or do other role than the state. And then of course, uh, the importance of metaphysics again, or religion, which is very important, spirituality is very important in this kind of discussion. And finally, the final chapters of the Julian dialectic, like an epic analysis to the left of Zizek. Yeah. I think it kind of, it's like when uh, I, Marx said that, or it was Hegel that said that, the anatomy of the man gives us the clues for the anatomy of the monkey. It's These last chapters give you the clue to understand all of your thesis. Yeah. In a completely different light. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I started reading, as I said, in the pre defense, the final chapter. I really enjoyed it, and I got back, then I read the whole thesis in the last week. Uh, I, I think there is a kind of a great division you have the first, the, until the chapters on Hegel and dialectics, you have, basically, you are within the ideology of what Lacan calls evolutionism. Mm -hmm. This belief yeah. that we are evolving to a higher state of yeah. things, this belief in the supreme goal, that's why we achieve happiness for everything. I mean, this, <laughs> if you frame it in the Lacan, it's yeah. very problematic. I was traversing, I, like the thesis is I'm traversing the fantasy in the process of writing it. I, I know, and, and that, yeah. it's very, that is very visible in the way you are writing, especially in the, in the final chapter. Yeah. So it's, this is not a critique, it's maybe a, a realization of what you realized already. But I mean, I think that has some implications for the way some of the discussions that we were having here have. For instance, the, the notion of common, I mean, the way you present it is as if you present it as a final solution. And, but common is not the name of a solution, or communism is not the name of a solution, it's the name of a problem, of how to live together, how to share the planet Earth in a way that everybody can have what they need to, to live. This is a problem, and there is no easy solutions if a solution at all. It's a daily battle in different fields, in different concepts that we all engage. 
So it's this kind of impossibility, this yeah. negativity, yeah. that Hegel and Lacan allows you to, to, to write. Yeah. Uh, so that's what, I mean, this then connects with some of the discussions that we were having here. I mean, when you say, for instance, how do we form communities? And a even like a, a question would not be like that. It would be, how do communities form that? That's because, how do we form communities against a desk exercise? You sit down and you write a nice book, how the world should be. But the question is, how could, how the world cannot be what we want it to be? Because there are something broader at place here, Freud will call them consciences, Marx will, Marx will call the infrastructure, that in a way, operates behind the scenes. How do the community stuff that we are not aware of, in a way, makes us uh, do things that we don't are very aware? And this also connects with these distinctions that you, you make. This, you have a union, and then within the union you have the, the split. The, the split. I think CZ gives you elements to go a little bit further than that. I mean, for CZ is that it's not that you have two poles that interact or compensate or opposite each other. Basically, you have one thing, yeah. but that thing is not all. Yeah. For instance, capital, capitalism, communism. You don't have an opposition in capitalism, communism. Basically, you have capitalism. Yeah. This is what you have. Yeah. Right? Communism and is not all. Communism is a way, is, is just a word to signal that capitalism is not complete. It's that you cannot deal with the problems that we have with today. It's not a normal view, it's not a cosmology, it's not a solution, etc. And we have to be very careful with capital. Capitalism is not an ideology. It doesn't matter what you think about capital. We can be very critical of capital, as we all are. But we still receive our salaries, we buy our programs, we, you pay the expenses to come here for me, I buy flight tickets, etc. It's not about what you think, it's what you do, it's an economy. So it's not like you have two poles fighting with each other, basically you have one, which is not complete. Men and women, the same thing with Lacan. You read Alenka Zupan's sick, what is sex? Yeah. Very clear. Basically, there is men. Yeah. But then, uh, Lacan says women do not exist. Yeah. They exist as a male fantasy. Know, it's yeah, like your yeah. femininity that yeah. they are delicate. Yeah, yeah, sure. This is just nonsense. Yeah, of course. It just signals an That's, the, mean, that's the meaning of the novel. It, exactly. That's the meaning of the novel. As you write. Exactly. Yeah. The same with life and death. That yeah. you are, it's not like they are opposite. Basically, we have life, death is a name for it, we don't know what it is. Right, yeah, but well, then in the middle of, because life is not all, yeah. it creates these categories that you, uh, Francis was talking, mm -hmm. zombies, mm -hmm. death, death, etc. Mm -hmm. et yeah, yeah. Okay, so this, I'm sorry, I read mm -hmm. Okay, so this was very, uh, really very, very interesting. Uh, but, like, I mean, I'm just trying to understand, to challenge you a bit to think about more about the and stuff. Because Isaac does offer you elements to talk about capitalism. But when I was talking about the, I'm more talking about like that's how it appears in the subjective mode of desire. Like the crucial thing to me in reading Zizek is like if you look like, throughout his, his 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 philosophical program, it's all about the transition from desire to drive, mm -hmm. and 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 the way in which the world shifts it shifts in turn in the way you're articulating the 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 the, 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 the basically the one is the not all in this transformation from desire to drive. Because it's the mode of desire it appears in this binary opposition. Mm -hmm. But in the mode of the drive, it changes. And and that's sort of what I was trying to get at the end with like the observer dependent singularity. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Can I think you brought it in the uh, this was chapter twelve? Yeah. You brought it? Well I tried to articulate like the, 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 the geometry of the desire to drive transition. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think you have this evolutionist. I know, I, 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 that's the biggest transformation in my thinking. It's the hardest to articulate it. It's the hardest for me personally and the hardest for me to interact with academia. But that's is, very good. Is, 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 is this, this, I feel like the, uh, the ideology today is an evolutionism. Hmm. And scientific ideology today is an evolutionism. Hmm. And how do we think beyond that? And I, I mean, that, I'd love to have a day conversation about that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, to, to me, to me, I see, like just last week, I was reading uh, Freud's three essays on sexuality, mm -hmm. and I see immediately in this break uh, the metaphysics of beyond evolutionism. And, 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 and that's, my, that's my, my deep passion at the moment, is, is how to think beyond that. Yeah. Okay. That's what I felt when I was reading the last chapters, and, and there is a, a contradiction. 
It was a big contradiction in evolution. Here's my favorite thing of contradiction in evolution, and because I lived it, was no matter how many arguments you have about evolution, you are not going to stop the Islamic or the Christian uh, social community. Mm -hmm. They're still organizing. Mm -hmm. Religious belief moves independent of evolutionists. Mm -hmm. Religious belief continues to move. Mm -hmm. That's the important thing to think. The drive of, of religious institutions. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, because religion is, I mean, if we, the moment we, we stop having a religion, we will no longer be human beings. And probably right. this, will, this will be the post-human society. Yeah. Like we don't need metaphysics. We don't need the, this kind of dimension that I think, for, and I think this is what Freud can think. Yeah, probably. Yeah. So may, may I can shall I show you to, to the question? <laughs> so my question is, uh, see, I mean, I have much stuff to say, but I think we, we can share it with you. Um, it's about, I mean, like I said, since you opened the field of the personal, which I really enjoy reading because yeah. I think it, it colors very nicely your uh, academic and theoretical research. And you mentioned in the, and I apologize for using uh, this information, in the pre-defense you mentioned the notion of traversing the fantasy. Yeah. That was the process that you went through. Yeah. Of course, in, in a metaphorical way, because this is a very clinical uh, process. We are extrapolating. So. I still have my leap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know that, I mean, the fundamental thing in traversing the fantasy is the relation of the subject with the symptom. And uh, the symptom is not uh, a malfunction, as every medical doctor know. If you have fever, the do a good doctor will not try to, to cure the fever because he knows the fever is just a symptom of something worse. So a symptom is, it signals, it, it offers a window to understand what is wrong with you as a whole, in a way. It's not just, okay, uh, you eliminate the, si the symptom and your life will be perfect. No, no, if you eliminate the symptom, you will no longer be yourself. <laughs> you be a completely different person because our life is structured about that real, that piece of real, that impossibility that we cannot stand. So the question is, before the people who go to clinic is because they are struggling with a symptom. It's a piece of real in their lives they cannot integrate, they cannot deal with themselves. And uh, for Lacan, this notion of transversing this, the fantasy is not that you eliminate the symptom, but you start to enjoy your symptom. Enjoy your symptom is a title of, is a, is a discussion of Lacan. So my question is, what is your symptom? How are you enjoying now that you're uh, the fantasy? Uh, to me, um, I, I might as well just get, get all the way personal. Um, to me, the symptom always, as you are, are already articulated, the symptom always emerges in partial objects. And the key to the whole is through the, the partial. And this is, this is to me, a big uh, perspectival shift on the whole evolution of the whole. You know, it's evolution of the whole to the, to your whole. And what part object are you playing within the whole, basically. And um, yeah, for me, there's levels to it, which are, which are light to type of toroidal, like really, oh, I'm, I'm gonna get emotional. Like, where it takes, it brings me to the, to the core knot of my being. And to me, it's sexuality. If I go to the core knot, it's sexuality. Um, on, an, on, a, on, a, on a, maybe just above, it's like food maybe, <laughs> right? Like maybe just above that, maybe it's money. Uh, and like each level, the deeper I get, the harder it is um, to approach, to, to, come to terms with the, to come to terms with what it would mean to transform that system or to enjoy that system. I mean, but at the same time, the deeper I go, to me, the more, potentially like the more powerful and the more strong I, I could become by not running away from it. And the less in illusions, the less in illusions. I feel like the, the big illusory fantasies are precisely covers or masks of the real. Um, and all this writing, uh, all this thesis writing is uh, a big mask that, you know, and, 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 and uh, now I have to uh, get, get, I want it to become more real. So we'll see a journey. <laughs> So uh, I'm from Central Jordan, 
have this business plan as well. So how can you see through those kind of pillars of expense and you have 10 minutes as well to please comment? Okay, thank you. Question. So I will be back. First of all, I want to uh, congratulate you with this um, uh, impressive work. You, as you have seen, I have uh, made screenshots of the reference size and the PIDD. They are only worth its uh, uh, index, so this is uh, quite impressive. It is also a bridging between um, different research fields, fields, and if I can uh, just name it in, in, in two kind of fields, then it and this is this will also be the, the subtitle of your degree. It's a doctor of interdisciplinary studies, philosophy, and sciences. I think that huh? this so will be the, the field. Doctor so of let's congratulate you. <laughs> <laughs> doctor of all the things. I'm not sure, but this big field. Uh, and it's already a, a huge umbrella. Um, what is also interesting is the fact that it generates quite interesting discussions, as we had already here in the, yeah, the, the third members of the jury. I'm aggrieved on the comment of uh, Francis that it's um, more complex that the things are divided in three epitimes and three uh, categories. And this was already discussed in philosophy, and I refer my reader to the philosophy of Bruno Latour, that was a Donatelli to criticize this. Uh, another thing, uh, nothing to do with Thomas Westwood, but <laughs> just to say before, uh, is that um, um, yeah, the distinction that you make between modernism and postmodernism, that is, there is already some philosophy written on something in between. For example, Bruno Latour again, and I'm also referring to the other French philosopher Isabel Sellers, in Cosmopolitik, they write on modernism, criticizing modernism, that they never <laughs> succeed in the project. So they don't, they are, crit they are critical to the big narratives and so on, but they don't identify themselves as a post-modernist philosophy. Uh, I want to refer to the work of Bruno Latour, who wrote the book, uh, Nina Rosa Merite Moderne, or We Have Never Been Modern, hmm? mm -hmm. where he unfolds the big project of modernism that never succeeded to be modern. I think I think Zuzik's response to that was, "We were always modern." We are always modern. Or we are still striving to be modern. Or we're still striving to be modern. Let me say. But uh, for the question, uh, actually, I would like to come back to uh, the question on the horizon, yeah. because actually, it's a very central concept in your in your thesis, and it's also in the subtitle. Yeah. And uh, three points I want to make. So what is your, how do I have to understand the concept of horizon in your thesis? Yeah. How do I understand the dialectical horizon? Yeah. What are the opposites and what is the interaction between what? Yeah. And then the final question, why is it the humanities dialectical horizon taken into account that if we are looking at, uh, at some uh, perspectives on revolution, that maybe revolution could be driven by new and technological engineering and leaving behind the biological part. So well, I would even put in my, in my yeah, sorry, but like for example, like it, in the in my presentation, I was saying like in the broad notion of technology, in the sense of uh, if even if we were engaged in mass scale genetic engineering, mm -hmm. necessarily we wouldn't we, we would still maybe be in biological bodies, but all of our genetic programming would be in some sense consciously designed mm -hmm. with, yeah. by, by technological processes. Okay. So I, yeah. I, I, I think so there's a lot of uh, uncertainty yeah. here. I, I want to rephrase the, the final question then, the, the position of the humanities dialectical horizon, what is the meaning of the humanities, right. what is the place of the body, yeah. and of the human, of the biology, but yeah. also of the body in the phenomenological meaning. Yeah. Ooh, you, uh, it's pretty easy. You can take that. Yeah, yeah. just, just no, no big deal, right? <laughs> uh, there's a lot of a lot of difficult questions there, and like a lot of really nice thoughts. Um, my first, I'd like to just say quickly about like Latour and Butler is like I have no issue with their programs, their epistemological programs as 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 articulated on the first order. My question is, what are their higher order consequences and what are the paradoxes that their, their programs run into? Like, 
Like for example, I mean, I have many uh, anthropological colleagues that despise Latour. Uh, I have, I mean, there, there are many uh, problems and tensions within gender studies which are caused by some problematics within, within Butler. So like, to me, both Butler and Latour signal major evolutions of thought. And now what are their higher order consequences now as we're are unpacking them? And, and what surprises come out of this un, un, unpacking of their, their, their work? Like, you know, what are the consequences of, of Latour's attempt to merge science and sociology or science and technology studies and stuff like this? And, and I think there are big questions. But so the three, if I could break down your three questions are, what is the way I, the first is about the way I use Horizon. How do you have understand your concept of horizon? How do I understand the concept of horizon? Mm -hmm. The second uh, question was? It's, uh, if you put the dialectical yeah. horizon, yeah. how do I have to uh, right. understand the dialectical? Sure. What is the interaction between what and yeah. that? Okay, so first I would say about the, 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 dialect, the dialectical, I'm not reifying any set of opposites. I'm not eternalizing any set of opposites. Mm -hmm. Like, like the, 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 the set of opposites that appear on a particular horizon are in some sense um, uh, very temporal, very historical. They, I mean, mm -hmm. like, the, like the, it, just to give the example, the, 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 the physics field, the, um, the emergence of general relativity and quantum mechanics as some mm -hmm. sort of binary opposition in the 20th century is, is, is a historical emergence and it could have emerged otherwise and it could have been structured otherwise, and, and, but, but as it is, it, 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 but it, in, in terms of pragmatics, it, it pragmatically structures a lot of work today. I, I have a, a friend in uh, the physics department um, who I was speaking to last night about the way he plays with general relativity and quantum mechanics, and it, 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 it structures his thinking as he moves through his postdoc. Mm -hmm. Right, so it, 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 has a, it has an effect on subjectivity, these, these categories. Now they're historical. And they'll change, and in a hundred years, maybe they'll be different. But I'm, I'm sort of saying that that it's something about the nature of the concept itself, that the nature of the concept itself fractures in this way. I think probably dependent on the subjective, the subjective mode of desire or drive. Like, like when you're in the mode of desire, I, I think, I think the concept becomes structured in this way. As, as I sort of meta was as I wrote this thesis. Like, my concept is presented to you as unified, but it's fractured in, inside, of, inside of itself. And I know as I was writing this thesis, I was in the mode of a, of a perhaps pathological desire as I was writing. Mm -hmm. now, so, so in that sense, that's how I understand the, the, the dialectical horizon. How, how I use the concept of horizon changed from the start of it to the end of it. Mm -hmm. now, at the start of it, I'm thinking of just like a, an, an open horizon of possibilities or potentiality, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, I, it might be quite conceptually aligned with someone like a Husserl or a Heidegger, even, but even if I, I wasn't an expert in their mm -hmm. writings, it might have a natural synergy with that type of phenomenology. But as, as, as the last part of the thesis emerged, it's much more closely related to this um, partial object. And, and the, hor the, hori the horizon is, is, is much less structured by this like open field of possibilities and much more about this play with a, with you might say a play with a symptom. Mm -hmm. Mu uh, much more, much more, uh, it, it's yeah. in, some, in, some sense that, in some sense that it's paradoxically more closed, um, but, it's, but it's by engaging with this it's by engaging with this part object, I think, where you, you get rid of illusions and you become more real. Mm -hmm. is, is, and, and that's sort of like, but, but that's like, the, it's, it's a horizon that's non all. Not all. Like, it's not a, a like, like a, a, a close or? It's not, it's not like a, I don't know, like the, the, the idea of like an open horizon as a clearing still to me gives this idea of like almost like a circle inside, turned inside out. Mm -hmm. If so that you are in the middle or? Well, no, like each, each, each it, 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 this inside out, this inside out horizon is, is, is made up of billions of humans. Mm -hmm. And where are you? Huh? Where are you? Well, I mean, I, I just, but that's the paradox of, of even discursively describing it, mm -hmm. maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but then like the, 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 towards the end of the thesis, it's much more about uh, 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 an, an intimate horizon with your own mm -hmm. 
little yeah. piece of surrealism in it. Yeah. So it's brought to life in art people in this. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, I think you 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 bring up when you when you highlight the way the horizon functions in me, it it, it, it makes me realize that I'm using that concept in different ways, in different ways, mm -hmm. and and that I and that I wasn't even reflecting uh, okay. as deeply as I could have on on the way I was deploying the concept. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So next speaker will join us is Dr. Nelkins, who will. them and like <laughs> which if you play as a game and you decide to contribute your scholarship inside and you put into that that much energy and erudition and, and uh, ambition as you do you would have uh, with 12 or 15, uh, 13 articles you would have a very uh, like you would have a very substantial contribution to the field and they would all understand and they would, they would consider it as a, as a success. Whereas where you interrelate them and what you do is like you reflect one by the lens of the other. So you, sh you show evolution in the lens of psychoanalysis. You, so, like, so it's like a reflective, like a con construction of, of mutual reflection. You, um, you like what you what you highlight is their foundational distinction and how they are because this is what, what you did in, in interrelated. So for me, uh, the way I see it as a project is very ambitious and also very risky because like relative to the this notion of success in either of those disciplines, you are risking it because they are like success in none of them. Uh, exactly, yeah. and uh, <laughs> and I, I see it as a, as your conscious choice and I like this choice very much. Because uh, it's uh, if you render each of the of this field by the notions of the other, you like, kind of make it look a little bit stupid as a like as a project in, in general. So and you don't do it completely symmetrically that like each is reflected by by all. But uh, like for example, it's not that like everything will reflect back on psychoanalysis the, the way psychoanalysis reflects on on it. But but I think there's there's a, a lot of the, uh, this. Uh, this, this internal reflectivity in your, in your work between those fields, uh, and also I, I see I see this this whole work as a like a hierarchy of distinctions, and those distinctions between those fields and views are the like higher order distinctions which you uh, frequently say that you want to sublate or like you you want to present some view that will provide some integration. It's not eradication of those distinctions, but it's it's an Interrelation, right? Uh, the second level would be those distinctions that you you project dialectically, like this and this and this and this, and you say like internally integrated but also divided and so on. So it's like I think you can relate it to, to this distinction dynamic you've been discussing with Francis at the beginning. And the third distinction, which interests me the most, because I think it's like a what you present is like a key of how you see the future of evolution from the perspective of humanity is this distinction between subject and object and subjectivity and like what is what is being perceived by humanity or by the individual human and so on, which would be the distinction between basically the self and everything else or something else. I don't know which which is which is what. So could you just say maybe a few words about this distinction, how you how you understand this and is it is it like the really the the most potent one in your view for from the perspective of the information? Uh, you made three you made three points 
that I wanted to engage okay. with these mm -hmm. in turn. The, 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 remind me the, 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 the interrelation of those grand themes and the like success, small success in the interrelation. That was the first. I guess, okay, the one thing I wanted to say there was that I've noticed that in what I tried to do towards the end of the thesis, I noticed some parallels with kind of what might be called um, Ken Wilber's integral philosophy, almost like the, the way he was approaching integral theory as like a meta synthesis of knowledge regimes, mm -hmm. like the way he's positioning himself as of 2019 is kind of like a, a meta-modernism or a, a you know, post-modernism was necessary, but we need to take this multiplicity and get a meta-integration going. And, um, you know, and, and I think there are paradoxes with this, and I, and I don't fully understand all of my own paradoxes with, with this, but um, the then the, 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 the crucial question you asked me at the end is about this relationship between subject-object, which is sort of highlighted and, and structuring most of the, the, the last half of the, the thesis. It's, it's kind of like the important thing for me is the, what I mean by the asymmetry of the opposites is kind of like what Alexander Pace was bringing up where you, you basically have one and you basically have one, and then it's symptom or something like that. And to me, objectivity would be the symptom of subjectivity. The subjectivity is really the, objectivity is subjective. Objectivity comes from subjectivity. There is no objectivity. Objectivity condenses from a subjective signifier. So really, it's about the subject. And it's, and it's about the subject figuring out um, you know, why it is even pursuing the truth in the first place. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's like, I noticed in myself over the Christmas break, for example, strange relationship between truth and the good and the beautiful. Because they're, they're, they're fundamentally different in a sense, because I noticed in myself that when I was first I really even think about the motion of my mind as kind of like unconsciously acting out what Hegel articulated as a dialectic. But like when you start, truth, it doesn't depend on the good and the beautiful. When you start, like when you understand what is uh, physics about, what is chemistry about, what is biology about, what is you know, anth anthropology about, you're trying to understand the objective world and you're interested in the truth but it doesn't matter if it's good or beautiful. It just is what it is. And then as you and then as you you include your own subjectivity in the search, the the role of your truth as you're going through the world, the importance of you know the importance of speaking your truth, the importance of the importance of, of living your living your truth, of being aligned with your desire, being aligned with, with, with who you are authentically, gets you entangled with these categories of of, of, of the good and the beautiful. And, and they all of a sudden play a, a much higher role in your search for truth. So to me, that's, it's not absolute. Like Plato was thinking about these things and like they pre-exist us or that they, yeah, they literally pre-exist us. They're like memories but that we have of some absolute substance or something like that. And I'm not playing that game like in terms of like the eternal absolute that exists independent of observers. I'm trying to understand the history and the temporality of observers and the way in which there still is a good and a bad, like, a, you know, like there's a funny, like I think I told you a funny joke I like, uh, Zizek has this book called Zizek's Jokes and he has a postmodern joke where he says, uh, the difference between the, the traditional and the postmodernist, the traditional would be I walk through the valley of the shadow of the death and I have no fear because God is with me, so I fear no evil. And then he says the postmodern is, is, I walk through the valley of the shadow of the death and I have no fear of evil because I know it's just a social construction. <laughs> 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 so, so 
something in this way is like, what is the nature of subjective truth as you're entangled here with the nature of good and, 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 and beauty and, and, and in an objective sense in some way, but not in this absolute reified essence sense. And the reason why it's important that it's not some absolute reified essence sense is that it is genuinely open. Like what is what is what is good and I don't know, you know, like what what is this? Like it is genuinely open and incomplete and, and stuff like that. And I'm, you know, at least I think maybe not. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, So this is how it comes to an end. It starts with you and it ends with you. <laughs> the beginning and the end. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, first I would like to warmly congratulate for congratulate you for your work, um, which I think is a very impressive piece of inter truly interdisciplinary uh, scholarship. Uh, you managed to take indeed the what Popper called the, the free world, so three uh, major perspectives, the objective, the social or intersubjective, and the subjective. And you do manage to go very deeply in each of them and, and try to make them communicate, which is, um, yeah, which is, which, which is a way to bridge the, the two cultures, or even, I would say, the three perspectives, uh, which I think is richer than just speaking of the two cultures. Um, so, yeah, so I think it's extremely rare to find scholars who are able to, to master these different perspectives and uh, as such uh, you largely deserve uh, uh, the doctor of uh, the title of the doctor of philosophy. Um, now I would like to ask you three questions. Um, Do each correspond to a Popperian religion? No. Um, <laughs> That's really <laughs> It would have been a good idea to do that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll give you five minutes to reach for it. <laughs> oh, uh, no, it's my country. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, my first question is about um, your statement. Um, about the idea of independence of different evolution, evolutionary stages in cosmic evolution. Um, for example, page 50, you write, the future of cultural evolution could be the attainment of a stage of independent maturity in the same way uh, biological evolution earned its own independence from physical evolution. Mm -hmm. So I would object that biology is still dependent on physics and chemistry and cultural evolution is still dependent on biological humans. So how can we recognize and characterize more specifically this independent maturity of an evolutionary stage? That's my first question. Okay. Okay, so, so you want to answer? Yeah, yeah, I think that's easier. So I because they're, they're probably two really complex questions. What I'm trying to aim at with that idea was I'm trying to engage almost with um, and it comes up in the maybe the second chapter where I talk about the history of technological singularity theory. Um, and specifically identifying these computer scientists who are basically saying that the future of computers are going to enter into self-recursive loops with themselves, where they're gonna start, once you have a machine that can design another machine, then those machines will start designing other machines, and then they'll just be independent of us. Like right now, artificial intelligence and robotics, you, that you need the human computer scientists, you need the, the human beings in the process to, to, to but they're not, a, but they're not on a poetic in a sense. Uh, and and the, 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 the idea here is that in the future of evolution, could you imagine a, a type of techno-cultural process where it's in some sense, in some sense, a, you have, you have, whether they're conscious or not conscious, you have these, these entities which are forming they're forming internal, internal boundaries and reproducing those internal boundaries independent of their biological origin. Their origin is biological in the sense that humans started the process going. Like this I think is articulated perhaps the best with, um, who is it? Um, George Dyson is the name? 
he wrote the Darwin, Darwin Among the Machines? It's, it's Freeman Dyson's son. Okay. okay. Freeman Dyson's son wrote a, a very famous book from 1999 called Darwin Among the Machines, which was very uh, influential to me right in that section. And he does a fantastic overview of the history of these ideas, uh, specifically uh, emphasizing Samuel Butler's work post-Darwin. When Darwin came up with the theory of evolution, um, Samuel Butler immediately applied all of these ideas of natural selection and, and, and its application in the biological world to the world as the industrial world he saw around him of the evolving machines and their possibility to transcend their, 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 their origin with their creation and human, human civilization. And to me, I don't know which pathway is most likely. Like you'll, you'll hear lots of technological singularity theorists who strongly believe that machines will transcend their biological foundation. Like literally the subtitle of the singularity is near is when humans transcend biology. So they're not hiding any of that, but they still don't have an evolutionary theory of how that would happen or how it really works into the bigger evolutionary scaffolding of our understanding on, on a cosmic evolutionary level. So that's what I try to approach. Is, is to almost take seriously this crazy speculation and, and try to inform it with what's going on in the human world. And, and that's really like my, my, um, my aim when I'm talking sort of about these strange paradoxes of like the, the modern demographic transition with reproduction and, and stuff like that, is that how is this connected? Are we... So, sorry, just one second. Um, yes. So would you say that an average an evolutionary stage is a new one when you have um, new mechanisms that are um, somehow evolutionary, that there can be selection at this level, that there can be autopoiesis at this level, uh, that there can be reproduction. Yeah. I guess it's like um, the argument like that someone like Nick Bostrom would give is like a substrate independence. Is like 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 for because for example like because you'll have you'll have arguments between different uh, like reductionist and holistic evolutionary theorists in regards to levels of selection at the level of the the group thing. Mm. Like you'll have people arguing about like does selection take place at the level of the ant colony or something like that. Um, but then when it comes to the future of technological evolution you're having a totally different form of evolution because the, the whole substrate is, is different than it's like, it's not, I guess it's, it's the, the, the fundamental code is different, if that makes sense, like, like, cause like what we're talking about with biological evolution is genetic codes, basically like, mm -hmm. and, and the evolution of genetic codes. And, and, and that, then you have, like I mentioned in the private defense, you do have this movement of lots of, you know, lots of different theorists in evolutionary sciences that, find it attractive to create the metaphor of the genetic code and the mimetic code, the cultural code. And so, you know, how far can you take that metaphor and how far can you, how far can you take these ideas and say, well, this is an early immature evolutionary process which is potentially going to gain autonomy from its biological origin. Okay. Uh, thank you. I, I'm going with my second question, uh, which is about um, your deep future hypothesis in chapter nine about the compression and expansion hypothesis. Yes. Um, so I believe that the two trends are not opposed. Okay. Uh, and the example I like to, to give is, uh, is uh, the global and planetary internet, which is a clearly a very global phenomenon, mm -hmm. but which is, so it's really an expansion from that humans have been able to do at the, at the planetary level. But on the other hand, it's possible, thanks to extremely small scale technologies such as our microprocessor, optical fiber, etc., that allows it to, to. So, um, so how my, quest my question is: How is compression compatible with globalization, and uh, and uh, could it be that compression and expansion are compatible? Right. Um, Yes, I mean, of course, that I frame that, that I say that chapter is the most speculative chapter of my, my whole work, and, it, and, and it's just a deep future of speculation, and, and um, you know, as, as, as you know, with deep future speculation, you, you, you take a risk and you jump out and you try to play with some ideas, and you could be totally wrong, and, 
and, uh, and I could be totally wrong about the way I'm framing compression and, 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 and expansion. The, the, the logic of how does compression, the idea of compression, um, go into, uh, how is it not contradicted with globalization, is that as we globalize, we're simultaneously compressing in terms of urbanization. So we're, 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 going into, we're going into denser and denser and smaller and smaller urban areas where there's lots of humans and they're spread all out of the planet, but 90, 90% of them are becoming hyper-localized in, in, in big, urban, big urban, urban centers. And like, for example, that seems to be a universal process because if you look at Asia, if you look at Africa, now those regions are urbanizing at a faster pace than Europe and North America ever did. So it's universal, it's accelerating in that sense. And so the compression could, 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 we could become more, more and more dense and at the same time being more and more global. And like the weird thing about the, the expansion is like I could, I could be, like I'm, I'm almost more attracted, I'm attracted to the compression idea because it's almost more subversive and it's less, it's more counterintuitive and it's less represented in science fiction. Mm -hmm. For example, like, uh, you know, 20th century often depicts expansion almost as a logical uh, uh, necessity. I could, like, the thing that convinces me about the expansion direction is when you look at, for example, maps of the solar system, humans just went to the moon, but we have robots everywhere. Like, our, 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 our technology is littered throughout the solar system, and so it could just be that expansion is the future of intelligence and consciousness, but that just it, it has to let go of its biological origin on Earth, because biology doesn't just, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not gonna go, it's not gonna work. There's too many problems even getting to Mars with biology, like who knows the problems we're gonna have going to Mars with, with biology. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, but they could not be both, like, like I think in your future speculations, which I've read, you know, you have in some sense the articulation that they're both. Mm -hmm. Because you have, you, you, clear, you clearly articulate that you think we're going to create technology at the Planck level, and then at the same time, you, you clearly also think that intelligence will gravitate towards these, the center of galaxies, or, or supermassive black holes and, and stuff like that, so it's kind of both, in, in, a, in a way, yeah. Okay, thank you, and uh, my next question is um, somehow related to Andre's question about metaphysics and transition at a smaller scale, looking at them at a smaller scale. And um, so if, uh, if it's really a kind of universal development of societies, these different uh, stages of um, chiefdom, multiple chiefdom, kingdom, etc., then um, do you think it could be applied to foster development in developing, <coughs> in developing countries or in, in places where Organizations are, are messy, where you still have warlords. Yeah. Um, There's, I do think that, but I, but I think that the current academic climate um, could prevent that because of political correctness. Um, there's now, I think now, I think that the political, I think that the political, I think the political correctness might be necessary because of our uncomfortable history. Um, so what do you mean? Do you mean that? Just I'll, I, 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 I'll give it, I think we need new language. I think we need new language about, uh, and, and that's p partially why I'm interested in, in, in trying to, and I think it's very difficult to think new political economic language at the same time. But like, for example, like in our narratives of history, now you could think about colonialism, right? Like colonialism is always depicted in a mode of exploitation, it's always depicted in a mode of we were oppressing, we're always depicted in a mode that, that we were winning and they were losing, but it's, it's, it's not that simple. It's, 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 now that is, that is, tr it is true, like it is true that there was horrible exploitation and murder and genocide and all that, and all that is true, but it's not only and that's where we need a new language because, because you can have these, you can have very radical revolts against 
dimension of so-called so -called Western culture, which are actually helpful, and which and which are actually and which are actually beneficial, and starting a conversation about how you would even start, how do you even start a conversation about that, is <laughs> is is not easy, and obviously I'm not comfortable doing it. <laughs> Yeah, but I, well, I did do it, but, uh, but maybe it would be an idea to have an NGO, which is Meta System Transition NGO. Or right. <laughs> you would you would have like you would have like I always re I always remember like when I was I always remember for example reading I, I was fascinated by uh, by by uh, I was fa I fascinated by history of 20th century Africa when I was in history in my undergrad, and I remember reading like this a thing that like is clearly stuck with me because it's coming to my mind now. Um, of like the first president of, of, of I forget if it was Ghana, it was one of the first, first West African countries that gained independence. And he made the point that we have this fantastic infra infrastructure, communication and transportation infrastructure, which is set up so that I can call London, but I can't call the guy down the street. Mm -hmm. Right, so the entire infrastructure of the country is like, we have this awesome you know, communication, transportation, but it's all set up in such a way as that it's benefiting England and not, it's not internal to, 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 to it's an example, it's an example of like this weird double-edged sword thing where like you get this interesting new infrastructure put in place which didn't exist a hundred years ago, mm -hmm. but it's set up in a very parasitical, very negative way. So not internal, yeah, it's not developed, internal. yes. Uh, yeah, and, and, and so, 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 Thinking about these dimensions of it, like you know, you, I think, and, and I think that, the, like, I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's something that's, um, uh, sorry, I don't think it's something that's like an irrelevant point of contention because I think it could really be a, a, a conversation that that switches, like, say, for example, a, a, a boiling point or, a, or 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 an ethnic tension that's going on in South Africa right now, for example. Um, like like what you would have with like I think it was like uh, Southern Rhodesia, which turned into Zimbabwe, where you would have the collapse of the economy because there was a revolt against perceived uh, European hegemony in the country. But then in the long term, the country suffers, and I think you could have the same thing happen in South Africa, what's going on right now with cultural tension. So these are very difficult these are very difficult conversations. But this is what we're going to have to talk about as a meta system transition to a global world. And, we, and, and, and these global world conversations, like, like the, conversation about, the conversation about the refugee crisis and, and what's going on between Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. It's like, I was, in, I was in Cameroon. When I was in Cameroon, almost everyone I talked to said they would like to come to, like, how can I help them get to Canada? Like, but it's not, a, it's, not, it's not a global development model. You can't have a global development model where everyone wants to go to Europe and North America. Like, somehow there has to be a global development model where, where People see the, the, the benefit of of of, of developing like the, that we have some equal development where, where everyone can thrive in the somehow where it's less asymmetrical basically <laughs> and and that's difficult that's hard. that's tough that's tough. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah. Yes, I have sometimes we can take the position that Europeans get the last word and cannot take it seriously. So if you have any questions, please. Now we're letting we're letting the proletariat. I have a question, but uh, I have to ask uh, Fazel. Are you familiar with the with the Matrix, with the movie? Yeah. So this week, twenty years ago. I took the blue pill this morning. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> Fall away from the map. 
markets they can continue continue to to operate and increase. But my question is not about uh, about Nero, it's about another character called Cypher, if you remember is the uh, one is he Baal? Uh, yes. He is is Judas of the of He of chooses the, the blue pill. He's he's the Judas he's the Judas of the Christian <laughs> I just wanted to ask you about the decision of Cypher to go back to the Matrix and in how would you reflect on it in this view of subjective uh, singularity? That was my question actually. Cypher, Cypher, the decision, the decision yeah. of Cypher yeah. betraying Neo going back to the Matrix after going out, yes? Yeah. After realizing the yeah. The real. Yeah. If you like. Yeah. Uh, it's complicated. But yeah. No. No. I mean, it's, like it's a really, it's a really good question. I love it. Um, I can't. I kind of like. I kind of relate that because if I could put it into like a thread or put it into a con conti continuity with what I was discussing with um, Al Alexander about about traversing the fantasy and how and how. Um, I feel like even throughout the writing of my thesis, I, I kind of like was was undergoing my own traversing the fantasy, and and, and you do have um you do have a, a, an option at this stage, like you do have an option of taking the blue pill, like you do have an option of taking the blue pill, the red pill, and I think on the, on the one hand, taking the blue pill is basically getting burned by the getting burned by the real, and just you know I'm just going to take the comfort, you know, like like I remember in that scene in the Matrix. I remember in that scene in the Matrix, he was he, he was literally saying, like basically like just set up the illusions in this idealistic desire way. Like give me give me the the girl, you know, just give me like the the girl, the steak, the the steak, the girl, yeah, the, the, the girl, the, the, the money, yeah, the girl, the steak, the money. Just give me yeah. that and just let me fuck me. Just let me don't don't give me this. We're in a friggin' machine ship fighting uh, the agents. Uh, and 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 I'm you know I'm, I'm gonna get you know I'm gonna constantly be under the attack by those weird tentacle things. Yeah. You know, just just set me up in the appearances with the and and you and so and I and I and I guess we all have that choice to make at some point. And I guess what I would say is the the blue pill is kind of like a good if we're gonna apply the matrix to like what I'm talking about like with techno cultural evolution and the commons and the possibilities of future evolution and stuff like that it's it's do you want to stay in the appearances of the old system like work the work the job that pays the rent and and let you build a family and let you have food you're not worried about that stuff that's kind of like taking the blue pill and then the red pill would be kind of like I'm going to make my life a crazy experiment, and I'm going to be in a lot of uncomfortable situations. Be from and there'll be painful situations, but it's more real. To, mm. to pop off. That's, that's the question. Is it more real? Mm -hmm. that, this, this is mm. actually. Mm. I mean that that's 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 my that's 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 my feeling. Mm -hmm. That's 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 my feeling. But I, but I but I'm not I'm not I'm like like I'm I'm, I'm like I told uh, Alexander I I, I I have my illusions. <laughs> okay, I think we. One one one, one question from you. You're the one. You're the one. Huh? <laughs> You're the one. We're all the one. <laughs> we're reaching the end it's of the not one. long slot, so uh, I think we should <laughs> stop here mm -hmm. and. Uh, it's perfect. Okay. Uh, the chair will now retreat to a different room to discuss and decide what we have to make. Because that was for the defense. We can we'll be back shortly. You can hang out at coffee and we'll be back.
Tonight, there's one there. Tonight, tonight we for a live one. On YouTube, they're expected to be three people. Yeah, London. Yeah, so London. That, so London Real. There's Brian Rose. Brian Rose is the guy who starts the London Real. He does the internet design. And uh, when I introduced him, myself to him at the graduation, he was like, "Can you meet me when I was talking to him about it?" Brian Rose. Yeah, and so he, he was like, so he just pulled me in the back from the the party and dropped the camera out. He's like, "There's crap all our ass." I didn't mess it up, and I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I don't know, but I just didn't mess it up. Well, anyway, so I'm going to do it. And then, so, um, but anyway, like that, that happened. I was like, oh, that's a good thing. And then, can you end my phone? Well, now I can't stop and spend it again. First of all, I was like, I was like, sitting beside me.
who invested in themselves, who went back to work, and I've changed my life. I started a business. I did it. You put a hundred people like that in a network, and they all say, "Dad, what we do?" And they're all doing different things, and there's spontaneous connections that we're doing. Like just like for example, my team, my team leaders, said like two days ago, messaged me and said, "I really like what you're doing, and I'm a part of this LinkedIn network." The, the final stage of this public defense, and because I only would like to do the formal part in Dutch, I will first explain what I would say in Dutch afterwards. Okay. So basically, uh, this is it usually worked in the title of a clinic table of doctor from the University of Humanities Studies on Philosophy, Political Science, History, and Sciences. And I will declare as the last doctor of English studies on philosophy, political science, history, and sciences. And say then at last, congratulations, but I will say now Dutch. Uh, so this is the template read. It says, Wij, rector van de Vrije Universiteit Brussel, de leden naar beslissing van de examencommissie, these people, elk en elk laatst de academische graad van dokter in interdisciplinaire studies in wijsbegeerd politieke wetenschappen, geschiedenis en wetenschappen. Wij kennen die diploma toch al voor de bepaling van het decreet van 12 juni 1994 betreffende de universiteiten van de Vlaamse gemeenschap. Alle drie keer taal en gemeenschappen hebben nagedacht. En 
den same list, and we have up there for Kevin Douglas. Congratulations. Screen. We have a screen, and now you have some time to say if you want to say something. Okay. Yeah, I mean, okay, I'll say, um, first and foremost, I still, I still, re I still remember um, the first time I, I sent an email to Francis, um, and I still remember the first time I was reading Francis's papers, I was in I still remember I was in the second floor of a, of, of a Starbucks in Toronto, and I, I came across your paper on uh, soup, the super the seven seven paper on superorganisms. Oh, super right, super. I was like, and I, I was reading it to the end, and I still remember like I still remember like in my mind while I was reading the paper, I was like, um, I wonder if you're going to agree with Kurzweil's predictions and stuff like that. And you and you at the end you were giving like your own perspective on it all, and I was just like. I was just, I was just, I was just captivated by, by the ideas, and I was captivated by the whole, the whole. After I learned about play, the whole approach, and um, I still remember how surreal it was first flying to Brussels, um, and and I think you had just sent me your paper, Return to Eden, and you sent it like the day before I got on the plane flight, and I was like printing out the Return to Eden paper and reading it on the plane, and I was, it was just all surreal, and and. And um, and then I guess finally I'll say like I, I still remember when I was like 18 or 19 and I and I imagined I, I really wanted to do a PhD on the singularity and uh, and yeah here I am and so like that that that's a, dr a dream achieved and um, it feels weird and interesting and, and I'm ready for the, the future and I want to just thank every all, everyone on the jury especially for your interesting questions and and Marta and Clama we've had a long long history together and 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 I and, and I just appreciate I appreciate everything. So thanks and thanks for everyone who showed up. Okay. <laughs> Yeah.